All right, so being, you know, this Philly club kid at this point in time, what are we talking, like 93, 94? 92 on, yeah. Okay. From 92 on. So what was the amount of time when you just, you know, you know, just rotating through the community and everything like that to actually starting to get some placements and working? I was out nightly handing out mixtapes, mm. CDs, doing recon. You hear about a place, you go stand on the line, you pay your money, you absorb the atmosphere, you see if it's what people have told you it is and whether or not it sticks to you or not, whether you want to patronize this place. That was a whole thing that I knew as a club kid. We go here because we like the way this DJ plays. There's a bunch of B-boys and B-girls here, so the physical energy in the room is strong. It sounds great. The bartenders are fast and friendly. And, you know, I think I was always looking for that that ecosystem. And in Philly, I was going to places like the Ritz, and I was lucky enough to catch the end of the baseline before it really finished. And then when I bumped into King Brit and Dazia and got to Back to Basics at Silk City, that was just like, oh, you know, that right. was ground zero for me in Philadelphia because this is 1992. King, at the time, he was Silkworm for Diggable Planets. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit ahead of the curve. Then you got the whole Philadelphia rap community that's alive and well at the time from Hilltop Hustlers to Kwame, obviously Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Cash Money and Marvelous, Fresh Go and Miz, Bahamadia, all that. And there's a great deal of people that might not know that those early Roxanne Shante, Bismarcky, and MC Light, KRS One, all those records were cut on Pop Art. And Pop Art is the original Rough House, basically. Mm. You know, that was all Chris Blackwell and Third Story Studios and all that space. So there was this ill connectivity between New York and Philly with record engineering and even though obviously those those artists that I mentioned are New York artists and have done what they've done, their earliest records were cut in Philadelphia. Facts. So where was your first gig that you remember playing in Philly? The first time I had the opportunity to play for a 21 and over crowd was at Silk City on a Monday night with King Brit and Dazia at a party called Back to Basics. Wow. And it was me and my man Mike Nice, who you might have heard of. Mike Nice did Tasty Treats at Fluid with Quest Love for years. I grew up with Mike in Jersey. Mm. So when I came to Philly, he was going to the Art Institute. I tripped over him and Lizelle Williams. And I'm like, the fuck are you doing in Philly? He's like, I'm going to the Art Institute for Engineering. And me and my mans and our other mans, Randy, got a DJ crew. You want to rock with us? I was like, hell yeah. Mm. So aside from the King Brit break in the club, me, Mike, Lazelle, and Randy, we were doing the whole Black Greek circuit in Philly. So on a, any given Friday, Mike would be at Temple doing a Kappa Step show. Mm. I'd be at Penn doing a Sigma thing. Lazelle would be at LaSalle doing some other thing. At the end of the night, we would drive the truck to each venue, scoop the mobile equipment, divvy up the bread, and that was how we cut our teeth. And those black Greek parties and those Temple University house parties that we did, we were doing them for all of our New York friends who were going to school in Philadelphia. And all of us are, you know, between 19 and 24 at the time, so we kind of just coming into our own as adults. But we also had our own little community inside of the city of Philadelphia of transplants, a bunch of cats that aren't from the city, mm -hmm. that have that, that New York party sensibility, or that New York selection sensibility that we were talking about earlier. And from 92 to 96, we, us, it was us and two other crews that kind of handled that whole circuit in Philadelphia for those four or five years.
Still working a day job at that time, or that's done? I was still, yes, I still had a corporate job. And luckily, I was in territory sales, so I wasn't reporting to an office all day, every day. Right. I was in the field. Gotcha. So I would pound my workout. I would go hit, bang my clients out in the morning, maybe see one or two clients again after lunch. I've hit my quota. I'm in the record store. I'm at the gym playing ball. I'm chasing my boys who are still in school, about to do their thing, and, you know, looking for the perfect beat. When did you get to that crossroads? What year did you get to that crossroads where you were looking at, all right, it's time to turn in my pink, you know, pink slip with the job? And I think I knew it all along, but I think it really hit me, like, late 95. Okay. About three years out of school, I was like, you know, I'm having fun still doing something that I've done since I was a child. And as much as this job is great and the benefits are great and the security is great, I've never seen this before. Right. So it's nothing that I'm, I wasn't attached to the golden handcuffs in that way. And when it got to the point where I was like, man, three or four DJ nights a week, I'm making anywhere from five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a week, DJ and three or four nights a week and hustling and something that I'm passionate about. Yeah, I'm making a fucking shitload of money over here in this job, but I'm not any happier for it. Mm-hmm. I don't feel any safer. I don't feel the security. So, what's the use? And I talked to my family about it. My mom's like, you know. You've always been decisive. If you feel like that's what you want to do, just don't fuck around with it. If you're going to do it, swing the bat. So having that support from the top down in my family was priceless. And that gave me the confidence to just say, you know, fuck this job. Right. You know, and I walked. Did you have like an exit strategy where you're like, all right, let me go ahead and save up X amount. And then when I got that, I'll be able to just, you know, float on that while I'm still trying to get gigs. Or did you just like. I was I was holding on to and seeing more money weekly than anybody in my family had ever seen. OK. So I, I, just that alone, you know, I was as smart as I could possibly be for a kid who didn't have a business model template to follow with my money. When I left, I took my stock investments, I bought a hoopty, right. you know, um, a big enough hoopty to carry a bunch of records and a bunch of mobile equipment in, and just went to work. And because I love the work that I went to, it wasn't hard work. It was easy for me to return phone calls in the day and then get out and set up gigs and do gigs at night because I just had more freedom and I got more fulfillment out of it than I got out of the creature comforts of a Fortune 500 job.